Hi guys. It has turned into a gorgeous spring day here in the collapse of global industrial civilization on this beautiful Tuesday, April 7th, 2020, somewhere in there. So, uh, oops, so much for my great cup holder. Uh, so it's now about 6 p.m. and I'm finally <coughs> getting around to my collapse chronicle of the day. And I already had my coronavirus chronicle of the day and a couple of stories actually not about the C word. <coughs> well, unless the C word is the collapse word. I uh, have come filtering in from uh, alert tribes members and whatnot. Uh, we're going to start out, we were on Bloomberg earlier, so let's just stick with Bloomberg and uh, we're going to have two stories in today's Collapse Chronicles. What is going on with methane emissions? And uh, you notice you will never see the word permafrost anywhere in this story. The words permafrost, uh, methane, calfrates, or whatever they're called, nothing mentioned about permafrost as we uh, hear from the Bloomberg Green desk. Hmm. Methane emissions hit a new record and scientists cannot say why. Hmm, I wonder why. Fossil fuel production and agriculture may be causing the acceleration in methane levels, huh? Airborne methane levels rose markedly last year, according to a preliminary estimate published today by the U.S. National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. The results show a dramatic leap in concentration of the second most powerful greenhouse gas, which is emitted from both industrial and natural sources. Uh, this is the graph of methane emissions uh, from the fracking, from the gas industry. You can see the track we're on in the Save the Planet natural gas. Uh, this is Rob Jack Jackson, professor of Earth System Science at Stanford University and chair of the Global Carbon Project. Take it away, Rob. Last year's jump in methane is one of the biggest we have seen over the past 20 years. It's too early to say why but increases from both agriculture and natural gas use are likely. Natural gas consumption surged more than 2% last year. Uh -huh. Methane levels have accelerated twice in the last 15 years, first in 2007 and then again in 2014 and now again in 2020. Scientists have yet to pinpoint the exact cause or causes. Virtually every contributor to the global methane problem may play a role from the oil and gas industry to human agriculture to wetlands changing with the climate. So maybe now they're lumping melting permafrost into wetlands, which is more and more and more what permafrost well, temper frost is becoming. Uh, methane is about 25 times more powerful a heat trapping gas than its nearest competitor, carbon dioxide, when extrapolated over the course of a century. And what they leave out of that sentence is that for the first 20 years or so, that it's up in the atmosphere, it's like 80 times uh, more potent of a greenhouse uh, gas over a century. You know, it starts to uh, wind down after about 20 years over a century. 
it is 25 times more, but we don't have a century. And we'll see if we have 20 years when it's 83 times as much or whatever. Anyway, just a little uh, <clears throat> inconvenient truth that Bloomberg does not want to share with us. Oil and gas producers have long been criticized for tolerating methane leaks at gas well sites, pipelines, and compressor stations. A June 2018 study by the Environmental Defense Fund estimated that these methane leaks are equivalent to two billion dollars in losses for the industry. The EDF did not take into account in these figures the gas that producers purposely burn at well sites to keep even more crude oil flowing, a practice that enrages environmental activists is called flaring you've ever driven across West Texas at night. Pretty spooky. Um, anyway, guys, uh, I think we get it. So we're going to go from that story about methane to another story, the bigger story, where the word methane, I don't think the word methane uh, ever appears uh, in this story. I'm not sure why not. Uh, it, might, it might somewhere. And once we get past the C word, we're pretty much done with it. This is by uh, climatologist Andrew Glickson. I have had the pleasure of interviewing Andrew twice uh, here on the program. You can find, I believe, it's two interviews with Andrew Glickson from Australia. So this is Andrew's latest essay uh, from phys.org. Phys.org, meaning physics.org. Uh, this is Andrew Glickson and being Andrew Glickson. <clears throat> while, we, while we fixate on the C word, Earth is hurtling towards a catastrophe worse than the dinosaur extinction. And this is just kind of uh, greenhouse gas emissions 101 for people just getting down into this rabbit hole. Book Hermit, I'm sure you will, uh, you know, Book Hermit is our, uh, our resident uh, climatologist. I think Book Hermit, don't you have a what is it, brother? Don't you have a doctorate in climatology? Haven't you spent, what, how many years have you spent being a climatologist, Book Hermit? Would be sure to weigh in on this. I, I love, uh, I, I love joking around with Book Hermit. We all love Book Hermit here. Anyway, we're gonna forget about Book Hermit for a moment and get back to reality and come over here. And what does Andrew Glickson have to say to Book Hermit? <clears throat> At several points in the history of our planet, increasing amounts of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere have caused extreme global warming, prompting the majority of species on Earth to die out. In the past, these events were triggered by a huge volcanic eruption or asteroid impacts. Now, Earth is heading for another mass extinction, and human activity is to blame. I, meaning Andrew Glickson, I, like Book Hermit, I guess, I am an Earth and paleoclimate scientist and have researched the relationship between asteroid impacts, volcanism, climate changes, and mass extinction of species. My research suggests the current growth rate of carbon dioxide emissions is faster than those which triggered two previous mass extinctions, including the event that wiped out the dinosaurs. The world's gaze may be focused on the corona panic right now, but the risks to nature and humanity from human-made global warming and the imperative to act remain clear. 
Many species can adapt to slow or even moderate environmental changes, but Earth's history shows that extreme shifts in the climate can cause many species to become extinct. For example, about 66 million years ago, an asteroid hit Earth. The subsequent smashed rocks and widespread fires released massive amounts of carbon dioxide over about 10,000 years, global temperatures soared, sea levels rose, and oceans became acidic. About 80% of species, including the dinosaurs, were wiped out. And guys, I just have to admit, I'm a, 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 a little bit uh, confused here. Uh, it sounds like that what Andrew is saying is that it took 10,000 years for the dinosaurs to go extinct from the asteroid strike. And uh, I, I, I mean, I, I don't know. Uh, you know, I think that what you were always taught in school was, you know, the asteroid uh, hit on Monday afternoon and by Tuesday morning, uh, the dinosaurs were extinct. That, that's the way I had always understood it, but uh, I don't think it happened that way, and I, and I don't think Andrew does either. But over the, the 10,000 years following the asteroid strike, 80% of species were wiped out. It's 10,000 years. 80% uh, of species were wiped out. I think we're trying to cram 10,000 years into about 100. Okay, about 55 million years ago, global temperature spiked again over 100,000 years or so. The cause of this event, known as the Paleocene-Eocene Thermal Maximum, is not entirely clear. Oh, the M word does uh, show up here. One theory known as the methane burp hypothesis posits that a massive volcanic eruption triggered the sudden release of methane from ocean sediments, making oceans more acidic and killing off many species. Uh, I'm going to go over to his link to the methane burp hypothesis. It has a a link to the methane burp hypothesis. Uh, this is a uh, a review of the possible role of wetlands, permafrost, and methane hydrates in the methane cycle under future climate change. Uh, so we have a whole nother uh, thing on uh, the methane burp where they do talk about the, uh, the, the permafrost and the clathrates and all of that. This is a little more highbrow uh, language, so we're going to go back to Andrew Glickson. What I like about Andrew is he's very good at taking all of this uh, complicated uh, science and uh, distilling it. And, you know, he, he takes all of these 50 cent words and he chops them up into all of these five cent words that us regular people can actually understand. Andrew's a very good communicator. Okay, where were we? Um, so, is life on Earth now headed for the same fate? Before industrial times began at the end of the 18th century, carbon dioxide in the atmosphere sat at around 300 parts per million. They usually say 290. This means that for every 1 million molecules of gas in the atmosphere, 300 were carbon dioxide. In February of this year, atmospheric carbon dioxide reached 414.1 parts per million. Total greenhouse 
total greenhouse gas levels. Carbon dioxide, methane, and nitrous oxide combined reached almost 500 parts per million of carbon dioxide equivalent. And uh, Andrew talks a lot about this uh, in my interview with him, if you, if you want to track that down. If someone can put the link to that interview. Uh, he talks about, uh, you know, we, we, we always, you know, hear this number, well, at about around 414 this year, that is only CO2. So if you factor in these ramping up uh, levels of methane and nitrous oxide, you know, in combination, a more realistic picture of what it really is, is a, we're sitting around 500 ppm of carbon dioxide level equivalents uh, when, you, when you add up the big three. Carbon dioxide is now pouring into our atmosphere at a rate of two to three parts per million each year. Using carbon records stored in fossils and organic matter, I have determined that current carbon emissions constitute an extreme event in the recorded history of Earth. My research, and I think he's, I think, Andrew's been uh, doing this for 40 or 50 years, my research has demonstrated that annual carbon dioxide emissions are now faster than after both the asteroid impact that eradicated the dinosaurs, about 0.18 parts per million CO2 per year, and the thermal maximum of 55 million years ago, which I don't know how they arrive at this, uh, about 0.11 parts per million uh, CO2 per year. So uh, if, if those figures are, are, are true, they're, you know, they're 20 times as fast, leading Andrew to conclude that the next mass extinction has begun. If it's the next mass extinction, then it hasn't begun. Are you following me, Andrew? This I know that this is semantics. So it's not the next mass extinction. It is the present mass extinction has begun because if it has begun, it's not the next one. It's the present one. So the present mass extinction has begun. I'm going to have to send Andrew a, uh, a, a little uh, note on this. <clears throat> Current atmospheric concentrations of carbon dioxide are not yet at the same levels seen 55 million and 65 million years ago, but the massive influx of carbon dioxide means the climate is changing faster than many plant and animal species can adapt. A major United Nations report released last year warned around one million animal and plant species were threatened with extinction. Climate change was listed as one of five key drivers of the uh, you know, of the biodiversity crisis. <clears throat> the report said the distributions of 47% of land-based mammals and almost 25% of threatened birds may already have been negatively affected by climate change. Many researchers fear the climate system is approaching a tipping point a threshold beyond which rapid and irreversible changes will occur, this will create a cascade of devastating effects. There are already signs tipping points have been reached. For example, rising Arctic temperatures have led to major ice melt and weakened the Arctic jet stream. 
a powerful band of westerly winds. This allows north moving warm air to cross the polar boundary and cold fronts emanating from the poles to intrude south into Siberia, Europe, and Canada, and I would even say Texas sometimes, but that didn't seem to happen much this year. Uh, it didn't seem like that polar vortex was very wavy. For some reason, it, it, it stayed where it was supposed to, I think, this year. A shift in climate zones is also causing the tropics to expand and migrate toward the poles at a rate of about 56 to 1100 kilometers per decade. That's about 40 to 85 miles per decade. The tracks of tropical and extra tropical cyclones are likewise shifting toward the poles. Australia is highly vulnerable to this shift, which brings us into uncharted future climate territory. <clears throat> Research released back in 2016 showed just what a massive impact humans are having on the planet. It said while the Earth might naturally have entered the next ice age in about 20,000 years time, the heating produced by carbon dioxide would result in a period of super tropical conditions delaying the next ice age to about 50,000 years from now. During this period, chaotic, high energy, stormy conditions would prevail over much of the Earth. My research suggests humans are likely to survive best in subpolar regions and sheltered mountain valleys where cooler conditions would allow flora and fauna to persist. Earth's next mass extinction, meaning the one that has already begun, is avoidable if carbon dioxide emissions are dramatically curbed and we develop and deploy technologies to remove carbon dioxide from the atmosphere if we just develop those vacuum cleaners to suck that stuff right out of the air. But on our current trajectory, human activity threatens to make large parts of the Earth uninhabitable, a planetary tragedy of our own making. That is exactly what it is uh, with or without climate change. We have a planetary tragedy uh, of our own making. It's just that climate change is going to put the final nail in the coffin. Uh, that, that everything else we have come up with doesn't manage to do it. Oh, by the end of the century, don't worry, climate change will, uh, will mop up whatever else stupid thing that we have done to take this planet down. So meanwhile, now that we have finished Collapse Chronicle of the Day, you can go back to, uh, what does Andrew say? You can go back fixating, fixating on the corona panic as being the single biggest threat to this planet. Uh, <laughs> yes, as we fixate on the corona panic, Earth is hurtling toward a catastrophe worse than the dinosaur extinction. Yepers, but we all know the one thing we're talking about on this planet while we completely ignore the asteroid in the mirror. But anyway, if you enjoyed what Andrew Glickson had to tell you about the future of life on Earth, 
please uh, thumb up the video. Book Hermit, you can thumb it down. And uh, while you guys are over here, please spend a few moments uh, subscribing to Collapse Chronicles and Corona Panic Chronicles. But I got to wrap up this edition of Collapse Chronicles because uh, I got to fire up the barbecue because me and the little dog have a big pound of big bag of uh, factory farmed chicken that we paid 57 cents a pound for at good old Walmart. So much for the corona panic sending the price of food through the roof. The corona panic is now priced factory farm chicken 57 cents at Walmart. And we wonder why there is an asteroid in the mirror. Get back out there and enjoy your lockdown. Fire up your barbecue while you still can on this gorgeous spring 2020. Bye guys.